supposed to be going. Okay, go ahead. Is it going? Apparently it's going. Yep. Good evening. Sorry for that <laughs> weird beginning. Yes, I'm sorry. That, anyway. But uh, yeah, we're having... Uh, it's not technical difficulties. We're ahead and we don't know it. So <laughs> welcome, welcome to the shop here in beautiful downtown Canterbury. Sorry, I'm a little delayed tonight. I had one of those days where I bit off more than I could chew. But I'm glad you're here because now we're just going to relax and experience some shop talk about countertops. I am working on a countertop. This is a little off the rails from our normal furniture-based woodworking, but it's something I need to get done. If you read the description, it's long overdue, like 24 years. <laughs> <laughs> you thought the eight-year chest was bad, but this is really something. But um, we're going to get right into that in just a second. But I want to um, remind you, if you want to head over to epicwoodworking.com, you can catch up on all the other content we have over there with courses and join in our little uh, club, our neighborhood yeah, we'd club. Yeah, love that. Yes, we would. And um, also, what else? You can find out about what things are going on. You really should sign up for the mailing list if you want to be on the front edge of every time we announce something new. So check that out at epicwoodworking.com. And of course, if you like this content, be free to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> All right. So here we are. I am working on a countertop. And as I said in my story, this, was, this countertop is going to replace a temporary one that I made just to get into the house when we built it 24 years ago. It's hard to believe that much time's gone by here in Canterbury, but I mean, the kids were very small. The oldest was four. So I can't, can you believe that? <laughs> I try not to do much calculating. It seems it's like yesterday, but amazing. I know everybody can relate to me there when I say that, because it seems to fly even faster as you get older. But I think what, where I went wrong in my initial countertop was I threw it together, but I made it almost a little too nice. So the temporary was just nice enough <laughs> that it never called out and said, hey, remember this project you had to do? Yeah. And, you know, once you get your sink tied in, you get your finish on there, it's hard to go back. Yeah. And... What I did was with that initial one was I just said, look, I got I to gotta get something on here. I got some pretty nice birch plywood, you know, what was available then. Ripped it into 24 inch wide pieces and biscuit and jointed it together and made this L that we needed. And then on the front edge, I put a nice cherry edge and beveled it and finished it off nicely. So it was a clean job. Very beautiful. Never had a backsplash though. Never had a backsplash, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, uh, but it was, once I got the, the polyurethane on there, it was golden and beautiful and it went with our cherry so cabinets nice. really nicely. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty beat now, as much <laughs> of the house is from uh, 20 years of child raising and it's time to fix up the house and pay attention to those things and I'm it's December 1st right now so if you're like me trying to get things cleaned up and nice for when the kids come home now that's what we're doing so let me show you what I did here I made a, a template of our countertop so you can see roughly how large we're talking and to make a template it's it's not that hard I don't do this a lot I've actually looked up and seen what other kitchen guys do, and I've done a number of these over the years. I have built cabinets for um, countertops and actually marble tops, and, but I don't get into this that much. You just simply need to rip some two-inch strips of, of quarter, even eighth-inch 
uh, masonite, or plywood, whatever. It doesn't have to be fancy. And then you're going to uh, lay it along the back wall and then along the front where you want it. You can secure it, but plan your overhang. And then the easiest thing is just to take a hot glue gun and glue these strips across the bridge and it holds it up. And then at the end, I just made the L shape. So this front edge, this is the overhang edge. And that, I have a, like an inch and a quarter overhang on the front of my cabinets now. I mean, with this. And all along here is the back wall. And it wasn't flush against the back wall. So I, that's a long straight piece. And the back wall wavered a little bit. So once I got these cross pieces on, I glued in these pieces and shifted them so this edge touched the back wall in every case. So even though they're spaced apart, that shows me right where the back is and I'd be able to connect those dots to know where the back wall is. Now, um, I'm going to actually, because I'm building a solid wood, uh, countertop now. I'm going to come off the wall a good quarter of an inch because um, we're, we're in December now and things are kind of pulled up a bit and I expect these to expand a little bit and I want to give them room. And I am going to have on a healthy backsplash so that, that change, that seasonal movement will happen underneath the backsplash and it'll never really be seen. All right, so this is my template. You can see it's just a giant L shape. We've got the sink is going right in here. So when you do this kind of template, I don't know if you can see it, but this is the center of my sink. And right now we have one of those pretty fast and dirty uh, stainless that drop in and sit over the top of the countertop. Nothing fancy, but it was nice. And now we're gonna have, with this new countertop, a solid wood, about an inch and a quarter at least, an inch and a quarter I'd say, thick, a flame birch. And I'm going to do an undermount sink. So this flame birch is going to roll and you'll drop in and you won't even see the edge of the sink. It's gonna be nice and clean down into the sink. And it's going to be a double sink, just like the current one we have. So this is going to help me locate exactly where to place the sink template to cut my undermount sink here. So there we go. Just occurred to me, I'm talking about sinks. I never do this when I'm a furniture maker. What am I talking about sinks for? But I guess countertops matter. There's right? a lot of people that probably do this work for their living watching. <laughs> I doubt it. Well, I have a lot to learn from them if that's the case. Um, but well, that's true. I... Yeah. So anyway. All right. So I've got my template all marked out. I know right where my wall is, so I'll be all set to cut it at the end. But the thing about working with solid wood is now buying stock uh, nice enough and then arranging it in such a way that you have the most beautiful kind of figured wood moving throughout. Now our friends at Goose Bay Lumber in Chichester, they're awesome. They, they ha they're like a boutique <laughs> shop for lumber in this area. And you can go in there and you can buy almost any kind of wood and it's all kinds of beautiful figured wood. And I called up Carl and I said, hey, I'm doing this countertop. What have you got that would work nicely for this? And so, you know, we talked about curly maple. Um, oh gosh, I forget the other one, but it was even, a, it was a softer wood. And I just, I knew from working with birch in the past, it had a nice hardness and a really rich coloration. You know, you have the yellow and the red, which isn't really red, but I thought that would be such a nice combination with our cherry cabinets because it has that hardness, but it has a nice flame curl to it as well. And we'd have the variation of the two colors on the countertop to mix it up. So that's what I went with. This, the curly maple, most often, he had some nice eight quarter curly maple over there too, but that's too soft in many cases. So 
Uh, that would have been a little too soft and a little too fancy, I think, for a countertop, right? You'd be afraid to cut on it. But this has a hearty hardness to it, so we're gonna go with that. So, I am faced with some challenges, though, because in the, the flame birch category, the boards only went up to 10 feet, and most of them were more like nine. And my long run here is 11, so I have nothing long enough. So let me just show you what I'm gonna do to get over this issue. I'm gonna get out my whiteboard here. Here we go. Hopefully this Sharpie is working. So let's just draw a representation of our countertop as it is. I would say that's about right. Okay, so something like that. All right, and our sink is right, is gonna be like right here. And we've got a little roundedness there. Okay, our little sink cut out. And we've got 11 feet right in this back wall. So, and I only have at most 10 footers. So I'm kind of challenged here. Right to this point is right about, let's just call it nine feet because this is about 25 inches or so from there to here, okay? So, so now what I realized was we have one advantage going for us in that you, you smart ones already figured it out, <laughs> is that on the inside here, we only need nine feet, so we could probably be all right if we figure something out here, but we've got this sinkhole cut out. So we can use this to our advantage. Um, to the sinkhole is, you know what? I forgot to measure that. Let's just look at our template. <laughs> Swing right around. We're gonna measure off our template now because we have this handy. We're gonna come over and we know at about 79, 80 inches, we're gonna start our cutout. So that's like just under seven feet. If we go come in from the wall, we're gonna be just about two feet. So let's, let's go back here. Let's say this is, this is now two feet. And from here up here is seven. Uh, let's call it seven, but it's a little less than that, okay? Okay, so using the sink cutout to our advantage, we've got shorter boards. We'll use those in here, and we don't obviously need anything long here. The only true 11 footer we need is in the back. So I'm thinking I'm going to hide a little seam probably over here in the corner, maybe up here. I'll have to talk to the camera lady and see where she wants that seam. <laughs> I don't know that anyone's gonna see it because I'm gonna try to make it really tight and blend it nicely, but it will be there. And then on our backsplash, we have the same issue. We're gonna have a little seam there, but I have very nice continuity to the color, so I think we'll be fine. Now, there's some issues with joinery on wide joints. So this gives us a chance to talk for a second about the, the ideal joint. Um, in the back here, let's see. I'm gonna just make a couple. Let's just say this is another model of our setup. If we did a miter, a long miter, like that, you might say, you know, that is the nicest looking clean as joint rather than you know what you might see would be all your grain running this way and then you'd have a seam right here and then all of a sudden all your grain runs this way and with wood that's very noticeable you know with granite you never see that it looks seamless it looks beautiful 
But because of the linear nature of wood, you get this really hard break right there. And it's not as pleasing to look at, especially when you have a more defined linear figure on the, on the top surface. So you might say, hey, let's just make a long miter with all the grain running like this, and then it'll be just making the corner. It'll be beautiful. It will be much more pleasing. However, you run into problems when you deal with long, wide miters like this because of the seasonal movement. You think you can get away with it, but there's something going on here that is way more challenging than here. So wood does not move along its length. So it never gets shorter and longer along the length, right? However, wood is always moving across its width. So it's getting thinner and wider across the width. So you've got an issue right here at this, this large wide joint that's gonna be a little over two feet wide. This is gonna be wanting to expand and contract and this along the length is not moving. So if you just glued that whole thing in, you would develop a crack along here somewhere over time. So what you wanna do ideally is bind these together with hardware and never glue them, or you could glue it in the front, you know, the first seven or so inches is what, as far as I would go, and then leave it kind of clamped together in the back. And I'm gonna show you some cool hardware to do that. Or you could just clamp the whole thing and trust it, but you'll be surprised how tight you can pull those up, and yet it'll still allow for seasonal movement across the joint. Now, we've, we need to allow for movement. We still haven't talked about this. Why not? Why not do that miter? Well, what happens is now you've got uh, contraction and expansion running together, okay? But just think of it this way. Think of a center line along this board. Okay, so in general, this is going to be, let's say it contracts. If this comes in like that, and this also goes in, and then it's going to be coming in from the other side as well. Okay, so this is contracting, contracting. What's happening along the joint? Well, out here on the point, the point is getting tighter as it shrinks. The inner heel of the joint, or the inside corner, is wanting to get looser because this is shrinking in that direction. So when seasonal movement hits over a really wide joint like this, the stresses are too much, and very often you will see an opening like this. So you'd have this, and then you're going to see your joint is just starting to separate. Now on small things like window trim or you know even across a width I would feel safe to glue across a certain width if I had splines in there and all. But across a 24 inch joint you're running into problems. Now when it expands what happens? You have just the opposite effect. You're gonna be getting tighter on the inside, so now every, all the arrows are going the opposite direction. So it wants to get tighter here, and it's expanding here, and it wants to loosen out here. So you're ending up with a joint that's open on the outside corner. Nobody likes that, okay? So this is, this is contraction, this is expansion. Really tough on a long miter. So let's go back to our scene here. We're going to, we've got the challenge here of not having enough 11 footers. In fact, we have none, <laughs> but we do have, I do have some, a couple 10 footers. So I'm thinking I'll run a 10 footer across the back and we'll put that little piece across the front. This is going to be the most, the most used piece. We'll be coming up and looking at this for the next 24 years. So there's an overwhelming uh, 
response that the seam should go behind the sink at some point behind the faucets. That that's apparently the way they do that. Ooh. It's hidden. It's oh, I know that. That's the way they do it with granite, right? Or is that the way... It, does somebody know for a fact that's the way they do it with solid wood? Or are we talking granite? A lot of times they do it with granite because it's fragile here and they don't want to move the piece without, you know, and have it break. However, with wood, I'm just thinking right behind the faucet, you know, I'm going to see it all the time. I know, I know. The faucet's slender. I'm not going to, I'll have to walk up straight on every time. <laughs> Another thought, there's a lot of different joinery um, ideas going on here. Oh, right. I'm not sure I'll be able to offer all of them to you. But That's okay. um, one, one is that, you know, shorter end of the L, why mm. not run that the same direction? I think I'm understanding the comment. Run it the same direction as the longer section. Oh, very good. Very good observation. Yeah, let's see how long that L is. Let me just... Um, Breadboarding was also another... Does that make sense to you if I don't... Explain? I know what they're saying, yeah. Okay. Um, the L is 38 inches over to where our fridge is, right here. So this is 38 inches. So let's just say, if we had our, our top again, and we had, as suggested, all of the grain running this way, why not just make our seam here and keep our boards going and have a nice pleasing effect? Not a bad idea, except you're going to be dealing with, first of all, you're going to have all end grain on the edge here unless you did some sort of breadboarding or whatever. You're going to have all nice side grain here that has a lot of flame on it. That's where we're going to see the flame. I'll show you more of the birch in a minute. Along here, if you do that, you're going to have all end grain, which tends to be darker, less exciting. So you're going to have a stark change in how the edge looks. The second is you're dealing with a lot of wood movement again because all the grain's running this way. Now you've got 38 inches here, which is a lot for expansion and contraction. And this, trust me, we don't have a lot of room for that because we've got a, a, a refrigerator that's captured inside of another wall and it just fits in there because you know who had to make it like a glove fit. So in my case, it would be Not a little me. rough. Expansion and contraction, yeah, no, <laughs> not you. You weren't involved. No. However, um, then, so you're going to have this 25 and the 38. That's, that's a lot. That's like 65 inches expansion contraction. So can't really, that's not ideal for my situation here. Of course, you could go with that if you like, if you had more room for it to breathe, so to speak, um, and you didn't mind the end grain. If you didn't, if you wanted to cover that end grain, you'd have to run a piece of stock across, and there again, you would have to allow that to slide, almost like someone suggested, a breadboard end. You could have spines in there and that were not glued on this end. You'd be glued in here, but you'd be having, it would get uneven seasonally. It'd always be not flush out on this end. So anyway, that's uh, another option. On the breadboard option. idea, Danny says on uh, the miter with stop draw pins underneath. Does that make sense to you? Breadboard on the miter with stop draw pins underneath. I don't, I don't understand completely. Let me, let me keep going on with my plan right now, and okay. then you guys can let me know what yeah, you, you think Yeah, you might need to just read all this later because there's probably some gems in here that I don't yeah. know to pick out. Yeah. To share with you. I mean, you guys can tell this is a project. <laughs> I like to come in here like Mr. Know-it-all, like, well, I don't really like to be that guy, but I like to be prepared, and I like, a lot of times I like to have the, the object done or have done it during the day. Obviously, I have not done this yet, but I have prepped and thought about this a lot, and since, since I'm dealing with um, the length material, um, I, and I love the, the material enough that I'm going to make it work with that. So here's my thought. I don't like that perpendicular grain right here, but I know I have to live with it to some degree. However, I do have that 10 footer that I want to run unbroken up the middle. 
So my plan right now is to actually do a miter on this, just this front board. And then so it's going to go miter and then across like this. So my grain here will be going across like that. And then this board is going to be beautifully mitered to this one. I'm going to domino and glue that together really nicely. And then this board, all of these boards are gonna be glued to this edge. But right across this seam, I'm gonna put in what are called dog bones. Um, I forget the official name. Does, can anyone tell me what the, the right name is? But this is a mechanical way to pull together a joint, used a lot in conference tables and things like that, where you wanna to pull together a joint and have it not come apart, but those, those are put dropped in- drop pins maybe? Yeah, those are put in from underneath. I'm showing them on top, but they're not on top. Uh, Stitches? Yeah, I'll show, you, I'll show you how they work underneath, but that's an underneath thing. So it's just gonna be mitered here, and so then the cross joint will be here. I hope that doesn't look too weird in the end. I don't think it will. It's just gonna be up and then we'll have our joint here instead of it coming right off that point. Draw tight, Bob calls it. A draw tight, yeah, I guess maybe there's something like that. So then I'll have, I'll have a, I'll be using almost a 10 footer here and then I'll be going with a piece long enough that I don't need the full length because I'm gonna use the sinkhole and then I'll have my long piece down the back, which will be seamed maybe there, but I don't really like it there. I don't want to look at it all the time because the sink <laughs> is right here. And I know that seam, it would be right across the yeah, sink. Yeah, we can hide it someplace. Under yeah, the... it's going to be too obvious. You're going to actually, because of the sinkhole cutout, if you make the seam right behind there, I'm having an undermounted sink. So this is just going to be all wood right across the back there. You'd see the seam on the front edge of the sink too. You definitely want it not there for this case because the way that the, um, the kitchen faucet is going in on the top like that. So Yeah, the suggestions are coming in and putting some epoxy in. <laughs> Make a little river of epoxy or, yeah. and, or maybe uh, does epoxy stop movement? Well, no, it won't stop it. Like you can't just stop wood like across the grain like that. Um, I am wondering if anyone has any, well, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but I'm gonna have all end grain exposed. This is one of the issues you yeah, run into with- the question has come up. Yeah, with solid wood um, countertops. And especially like in this case, I'm going to have an undermount sink and it's gonna be moving, so I just wanna expose the end grain. I wanna seal that. Now, my, my intention is to use this finish. So I'm gonna use Armor Seal General Finishes, and I'm gonna go over it with semi-gloss, several coats, and then my last coat will be a satin. So it'll be a nice satiny look. This stuff's really nice. It's, it's a urethane blend, so it's quite durable. It'll hold up really nicely on the countertop. And if it starts to get worn out, you just wipe on another or brush on another coat. It's thin enough, it flows out beautifully. It's not a, it's really a easy finish to use and restore. However, it's that end grain, you do not want to deal with moisture there. So my question was, does anyone have any experience thinning uh, or using thinner um, epoxy on the end grain, like as an initial sealer. I've watched guitar makers use it. I just saw a video recently of a guitar maker and he used the epoxy as the first coat on this beautiful hollow bodied um, guitar. And I was like, what? But he, he wiped it on and then he wiped all off he could. And that was the initial coat. And then he went on with, I think, I don't know if he went on with lacquers or what, but that was the initial sealing coat. I, I think epoxy is incredibly resistant to water when it's applied right. So it's not going to stop the movement, but I wonder if anyone has any advice um, along Michael those lines. Michael says, I made a wooden countertop for my daughter's bathroom, sealed it with exterior poly, 
and still the wood blackened from water moisture. Now I've got to rip it out. Is in, poly in the epoxy or is that different? Is what? Exterior poly, that's not epoxy probably. No, it's not epoxy, but it is polyurethane. Um, so it didn't stop. Yeah. Frame the sink opening, Tony suggests. I thought of framing it, but then when you frame, there again you're working with movement in this way. So you're going to be having a frame. If you went with a frame, you'd have it going around like this. And the wood grain of the frame is going this way. And, you know, you could, easily, you could frame it. And I've, I've considered doing that and using some home shop sawn veneer and making my own top veneered over a solid, over a, a stable substrate. Then you don't have to worry about wood movement. You can do a long miter. Everything's heavy veneered, but you would, you run into issues at the sinkhole because you have to frame it with something solid. And you could, you could do that and then run your veneer over the top and cut your sinkhole. So you'd just be seeing side grain. It'd be nice, but you do have that veneer would have to transition to the wood. So you'd have this vulnerable kind of veneer edge as you transition to the the sink and I would try, I want, I love the look of the unbroken kind of flow into the sink, almost like granite has that smooth look. So my ideal situation, and I am going to pursue this and maybe some of you will know this, is to treat these end, this end such a way that it's worry-free. Okay, so I wanna treat it, I'm gonna find out. I think, I have this sense that thin um, epoxy would work well and hopefully it's compatible with top coats like this <laughs> but just you got to really get the end grain sealed so there's some suggestions of some boat um, boat finishing products you'll have to read this yeah um, I've messed with some of those as options and some thinner epoxy has been suggested yeah um, somebody says how about the sink that just covers the wood <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have that Imagine now. That concept, but we, we that's been long bypassed. I have uh, that sink right now. I want to I want to do an undermount. In fact, I was up at this historic place in New Hampshire called Castle in the Clouds, built in the early <laughs> 1900s, and it's an amazing um, craftsman-like structure, right? I mean, remember? Isn't that an unbelievable place? Do you mm -hmm. remember going in the kitchen? Um. Uh, I'm sorry, I was reading. I don't know what you're asking me. <laughs> Man, this feels just Can like at home. <laughs> it was no. only for a split second. No, I know. That's all right. Okay. I was talking about Castle in the again. Clouds. Remember Castle oh, in the Clouds? Yes, Do you yes. remember going in the kitchen there? Uh huh. Yeah. I love and it. And do you remember seeing the countertop? No, I don't remember. Specifically. Okay. The countertop stood out in my mind because it was mahogany. And it was a beautiful mahogany countertop. They even had a little, almost like a boat ramp, very slight, going down on one side where they had made this very slight pitch so the water would run down into the sink. And it rolled right over the edge. And the edge was fine. And this is like so 100 years. years old. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know what they did there. Yeah, Todd says, mm, all this contemplation, I see why it's been 24 years. <laughs> yeah. I, it's a You're good right. problem it's, you need to stew on, right? Epiphan, right. Epiphanus, A P I F A N E S. Yes, Epiphanus. Yeah, I have that. I actually have some of that because I did a bow project with someone. Maybe I will try that. But I'm not sure. I don't want to do that on the whole top. Maybe, yeah, maybe there's we'll some to. really great suggestions yeah. from Tom. All right, so you let me just show you. an audience of minds here that have some good ideas. Okay, let's look at our material for a second, and then we'll talk about how I'm going to put this together. This is the, the front, maybe you come around this way, okay. so you can almost look at it like you're coming up to the sink. Right in next to me here. Okay, so I tried to pick one that had some really nice variation between the yellow and the red, even though this isn't gonna be red red. I love that kind of character there. The sink is gonna be right around here. Well, if we measure in, we know it's, where are you going? Okay. I had to back up so I could see what you're showing. Oh, okay. The sink is going to be... Let's not rush into this, Cecil says. <laughs> What's he talking about? 20-something years? Not a chance. Not a chance. Come on. Be gentle. All right. So then... Not, it's not red birch, is it? 
Yeah, well, Flame. red red and yellow come from the same tree. The red birch is simply the heart of the tree. The yellow birch is the sapwood. Okay, so I've got both here. So if I flip it over, I have mostly yellow. See that, nice and clear? But toward the heart, you're getting, you're getting both. And I want that, I think that'll look nice with our cabinets. So this will be approximately where the sink is. And this is, so this is the front. And way out here, if I come out to the nine foot mark, right about here, you wanna come on down? Sure. This will be that front board where I'm gonna have that 45. And then I'll go on up to the wall to my 11 feet here with that shorter piece, which is gonna drop into the sink. Here's my backboard. It's also red, but it's not as nice a piece, so I'm gonna kind of push it to the back, and that will be the one we'll have to piece in somehow. All right, so that's my front. Now, along this seam, I want those join, I forget what someone called them. Draw tight? Draw tight, yeah. So here's, here's an example of them. Sometimes you see them and they're circular, and they're, they resemble more um, like the old-fashioned dog bone. Uh, a lot of times, we just refer to them as dog bones when we are doing these conference-like tables. Um, they're great for pulling together conference-type tables. So with this kind of thing, you want to set it in, embed it from underneath, and it gets put in there and tightens up, and you, it makes a beautiful joint. However, with this countertop, I'm gonna use these in conjunction along that joint with dominoes. So I get the alignment. I never go out of flush on the top of my counter because that's gonna be allowed to move, that joint. It's at 90 degrees and you don't want it to go out. That's a great place to use some uh, loose tenons unglued to keep your, your alignment true. You could glue them in one side if you want, but you have to have that ability for it to move. I'm gonna do a lot of dominoing along the seams here too. You notice the beautiful effect here is that I was able to get these amazing flame birch boards that are all, that one's nine, that one's 10, and that one's a little over nine. So I'm gonna be trimming these and cutting them down so that I end up with my 25 inch, it's 25 or 25 and a quarter deep with three boards. So it's gonna be beautiful. I'm gonna to try to maintain the yellow along the edge so that when I glue them up, the seams will be less visible than if I cut into the red on one side and I had a hard line with the red into the yellow on the next. So if I can maintain, and you can see I've got plenty of yellow on the borders here where I'm gonna trim these in such a way that once they're glued up, it'll be much harder to detect the transition or the seam if I can keep some of that yellow on both sides of the seam. Okay, that's just a little tip for making things look nice. All right, lastly, I wanna blast through. Uh, I, have to make, I have to make a little jig to put these in. So pretty easy if you take a, first I had to lay it out. Let me, uh, let me show you with my router. This is a classic case where it's nice to use collars, right? Okay. Okay, so we've got the collar inserts, all different sizes, and use these in conjunction with a plunge router. Here, what I did was I already put in the router the half inch collar. Half inch is the outside diameter. All of these collars are well described. Up above, you can see the outside and inside and you can measure them right off there if you want. And then in the router, I've got a 3 8 inch bit. So if I lock it there, you can see I've got a 3 8 spiral cutter, which is gonna be cut more smoothly and easily in this harder wood. And the offset then on each side of the collar is 1 16th of an inch. So I know if I make a template 
against which this collar is going to bear. I have to make the template a 16th inch smaller than the line I want to cut because that cutter is going to be over a 16th, making it, you know, either larger or smaller, depending on how you're thinking about it. So when I think about making a template for something like this dog bone to use in conjunction with the, um, the collars in the plunge router, I just need to take one, I'm trying to get one that's clean looking. Here we go. Okay, so they got this fairly simple mechanism. And if I just get a rule here, each end is an inch and a quarter long. And this is gonna drop into a space and I need to get a wrench in there. So I want this to be wide enough or my slot big enough for the wrench. So let me just get the wrench on there and just say how wide a slot I need. Okay, so that's a little under 716. So I'm gonna make, if I make it a half inch wide, I'll be easily able to get the wrench in there and tighten it up. Okay, on the other end, could be about the same because I have to allow room for the threaded rod to extend deeper into that mortise as well. So I've got a half inch guide collar on here. So I'm gonna make that come in and I'm gonna leave some slack. So I'm, this, this um, shank of this threaded rod is a quarter inch. So we're gonna be routing a 3 8 inch wide hole. So that's gonna allow some room. If this does need to slide with seasonal movement, it'll have a little give there, okay? And so what I wanna do is make a template that will allow me to plunge route that slot, that opening, so that this will drop in. It has to go about 7 eighths of an inch deep into this thick material so that it is aligned approximately centered across the joint. So it's gonna drop in about half the depth and then I would lock it in. But I have to have a recess, a mortise, this shape in order for that to go in nicely. So I know from this center section right here has to accommodate my guide collar. So it has to be a minimum of a half inch wide. So I've got, I want that to be just a little wider than a half inch so that the collar doesn't bind up. It doesn't have to be perfect in any way. It's just a slot for the, for the um, neck of this bolt. And then we have at each end, I need more depth. So I want a, the collar to fit this way and I'm gonna be plunge routing in this direction. And I want, I want it to have about a half inch opening here. So what I did in my drawing here was draw it at five eighths because I'm accounting for that 16th inch offset. So when the bearing rides against the template all around, it's actually gonna route a slot that's only a half an inch wide. Now what about the length? The length, I made it quite long because I've got the inch and a quarter then I'm going to be coming out and I've got the roundness of the bit. So I want that to sit flat. So I want to go far enough that I get to the flat of the cutter. I'm going to leave a rounded hole at each end because of the roundness of the bit. So I'll have a round there and a round there. But I want the flat to be long enough so that that flat sits flat. So I've got a 3 8 diameter cutter. So it's 3 16 to the center where it gets flat. So I'm going 3 16 plus another 16th, and I've got my additional quarter on each side. So I need to make that slot an inch and three quarters. Or you could think of it this way, I'm 5 eighths inches, 5 eighths off that center half. I wanna make it 5 eighths wider on each side. Now, I could go to the trouble of plunging and routing this out, cleaning it out um, with another router or something. And you can certainly do that. I've done that many times. Um, the, you could just take a piece of stock 
and tack a straight edge using another piece with a collar and plunging those openings. Another way to do it is to just take pieced stock and glue it up. And I'm going to show you that method right now. It's pretty simple. Let me just... Tom, um, there was a mention here that, that uh, connectors with round ball hole with round ball with holes in it that an Allen wrench fits into? You don't yep. have to worry about spare space for the wrench? <clears throat> right. Yeah, there are other types of connectors. So what I'm showing you is a mortise for this one. But yeah, you see in manufacturing all the time these little round ball ones mm -hmm. that are pretty cool. And they, so they're blasting out. They're just coming in with a plunge cutter that's cutting a circular hole, basically, and very quick. All right, so I'm gonna just show you really quickly how you can do something like this. So once I've drawn what I'm after here, this is what I'm after. So now I wanna reproduce that. I know that this space between here, I, I realized that the length I needed between here was, oh, I forget, it's, it's right around two and seven eighths or so. Um, <clears throat> yes, that's right. So I'm, I'm going two and three quarters, then I'm going to gain a sixteenth on each end, which is going to give me two and seven eighths when this is in about the right position. So I don't have to put too much thread on there and we don't have too much thread extending. Okay, so it'll be right about like that. So two and seven eighths. So this space is two and three quarters. So here I go. I've got some pieces two and three quarters. These are both two and three quarters and square on this end. So I'm just going to assemble them right on this piece of plywood here. I put them down like this. I need a half inch spacer for that, for that middle slot right there. So I'm going to set that right in between. That's just going to act as a spacer. Okay. Now I'm going to take a straight edge on one side and say like, okay, those are gonna be straight along that edge. But if I look, I wanted to come off this corner five eighths of an inch in each direction and then have a five eighth inch gap right here. So watch how simple this is. If I just take, you don't have to get your router out or anything. If I just take this and set my square to five eighths of an inch, And I'm going to mark back on all these corners, okay? I'm just going to go like that, like that. Come back here. And come back here. Okay, let's bring them together. All right. So that's where I want to leave a gap here. So look, I've got these 5 8 inch wide pieces. I just rip this stuff, rip a half, rip a five eighths, and just square the ends. It doesn't really matter how long they are. I just have to fix them so that they're in this position, right in there, right like that, okay? So I'm just gonna use some really quick glue, some thick and quick. <laughs> I don't get to use this very much, but here we go. This is a good opportunity, right? We're gonna put a little bit on each edge, so thick. But don't worry, it's quick. <laughs> Sorry, it's been a long day. <laughs> and I'm missing a good football game right now. All right, so <laughs> this is too fun. I won't All right. tell you what's been going on in that game. Don't tell me. Don't tell us. I'm a little afraid. We're recording it. No, we're not. Oh, we're not? Well, it's not. A, well, we, we can watch it back on the NFL. Okay. Plus, it's on Prime. It's on Fox, and we're not getting Fox these days. It doesn't. How, how close to the top surface can the antenna. depth of the mortise be to avoid swelling of the top surface, like when fitting biscuits? Um, well, this isn't really a problem because I'm dealing with such thick material. I'm going to be, um, let's see, almost a half, three eighths of an inch away from the top. But. Um, so it's not really an issue with this. But look at this. But in general? In general, I would always go at least a quarter inch below the surface for that swelling factor thing. But I glued on both sides, look, and I set those five-eighths to that line. 
Now I just have to bring a straight piece in on this side. Okay, this is all the same. This is just quarter inch Baltic birch. So there, I've got my half inch, I've got my five eighths wide, and I'm stepping back five eighths from each corner, just like my drawing. Okay, once you draw it out, you can just piece it together using these negative spacers like this. And then we'll get the other side. Let me just explain to you. I would get the other side, I put the glue on both pieces, same way, and then I would glue on another piece. And then I would, it would be glued there and I would pull those together and I would have my joint. And I would just put a little clamp on there, something like this. Okay, so I would have one like this. Move my stuff out of the way. Okay, and I'm, and I'm gonna take these clamps off. I just did this one earlier. So I put them on like that to just pull that together, keep everything flush on the top. And there it is. Okay, and then let that settle. And you'll end up having one like this. And then this piece was just a spacer, so that just pulls out. Now we've got a perfect template to route this dog bone. Now, this is gonna be the seam. It's gonna line up with the middle. Let me just go ahead and mark that. <clears throat> if I want it across the middle, I'm two and three quarters. So I'll go inch and three eighths right there. Let me give it a little straight edge. So this would be the seam across the center if I wanted it pretty close to the middle. So if I was gonna set this up in something like this, say this was the underside of a piece I wanted to join together in this manner, I would set this line along the seam, just mark it, set it right in there. Okay, and let's see, I don't have, I gotta clamp this somehow. Let's do it like this. Tony's asking, what will be the difference between using a mechanical fastener or a domino in the corner? Did, did he miss you saying something about that? A mechanical fastener? Um, well, this... I think this is the mechanical it, fastener. This right? is the mechanical, okay, well... The domino doesn't, I'm going to use the domino as splines for alignment and not put glue in them. We're trying to allow this to move a little bit. This mechanical fastener is going to give a pull across the joint where the domino doesn't have that. It's mainly an alignment and it's a secure, if you do glue up the joint with a clamp, then it stays. But when you're leaving the joint dry, the domino does not necessarily have that holding together action where the mechanical thread, you're basically threading this in. I'll show you in just a second. Well, it's pulling together. It's not like, a sh it's not a shim, it's... Right, it's, a, it's pulling the joint together. Draw tight idea, yeah. It's pulling it tight, yep. So watch, you'll see it in just a second. So I'm gonna snug this on. So I would tighten this up. Oh, this is kind of out of alignment. Got a little different thickness material. I think I can just go with it and even if that pulls up. I'm just making it work right here right now. Um, so now I just set my plunge router. It's going to stop at a depth of seven eighths. So we're going to just plunge into these and do a test run. See if it works. Okay. Here. I'm going to get on my gear, my headphones and my safety glasses. And here we go.
I've got to um, get some of this out of the way. Actually, let me get my vacuum. There you go. One more. Okay, so a lot of times when you're doing this, the pieces are together at a right angle to each other. Um, here we just, I'm just showing you with side grain. Um, but once you've got that, I know it slipped a little bit. This is just a trial experiment. I haven't done this yet myself, but you can align them and then drop in the bone. And then that allows for the wood to expand. No. No. No, very little. Usually I, you're dealing with an, uh, things at opposite angles or you're dealing with a, um, a comp... Um, sorry, let me get this straight. I got this... I got to get the right direction. It feels like dyslexic to think which way to turn this um just to pull together the pieces so a lot of times you'd be using a type of material that does not move so once you're getting it close you can see the bottoms of the panels are starting to hold now if I wanted flush alignment I would I use I use this in conjunction with the dominoes I domino referencing off the top surface so that when these come together, the dominoes are aligning everything. But I'm not gluing across the dominoes because this is used in a case where you want to disassemble or you want to allow for movement with cross grain. So on this large countertop in the back, I'm going to have at the L grain coming this way that's expanding and contracting but not moving the other way. So I'm not going to glue it, but I'm just going to snug it up. Right here. You have equipment for milling this large stock, correct? I, uh, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to take it slow, one board at a time, and uh, I want to get it thicknessed the best I can. That's the nice thing. If you can do it in smaller pieces, it makes it a lot easier. But let me just finish up showing you how beautifully that came together. Um, it's one thing on this side, but you'll, you'll know it's not great on the other side right now because I didn't really go deep enough, and that was, I think I got some crud. Have in. you looked into uh, the domino connectors, mechanical fasteners instead of their wooden tenons? Have you looked into those? Oh, yeah. Uh, I haven't, actually, I haven't 
studied those enough to tell you how they work, but um, when I was at a woodworking show, man, it might have been, it was at least two years ago, one of those big ones in Atlanta or Vegas, I think, and um, they were showing off these dominoes. They were large, and they were using them for assembling beds in lieu of uh, tenons and bedposts and things, and I remember looking at them. I can't remember how they functioned, but they were quite effective, so check those out. It's like using a floating tenon in such a way that you do get a pull factor, but I forget how they work mechanically. But this is the what I'm gonna use under this countertop where I wanna allow for seasonal movement, but um, not glue it up. How often would you recommend checking the dog bones for tightness? You, you really don't um, have, have to worry about it because look, they're really close to the seam. They're only, in this case, they're only what, an inch? Not much more than yeah, an inch. Does it have to be deep enough to draw it together evenly? Is that an important? Um, I put it, I sink them so that they go close to half, the, right in the center of the material. Um, but, you know, use your judgment there. But these are not, I mean, you've only got that much wood there. So you've got an inch and a three eighths. And on the other side, quite often you have it end grain or you're using a substrate that is a composite material like plywood or something that has negligible movement. Here, the only movement would be across that inch and three eighths. So when you snug these up, they're really not gonna be opening up on you. Um, and you don't wanna have to check them on a countertop because you're gonna be screwing the whole countertop. Your sink's assembled, you really can't get under there. So I'm not gonna worry about it. I'm gonna put these in. I'll probably have probably two or three across that small se section. And I'm not gonna worry one bit about them. I know they're gonna be dead flush on the top and I'll be gluing across that inner miter, so. That's my plan, and I think I'm sticking to it <laughs> until I read your comments. Is this similar to the channels that you use, people use in long tables? Yes. Yeah, this, this is an option for long tables, like piecing up conference tables, very common. Um, I've used them a number of times when I've made large, actually, Harkness tables for the, uh, for the high schools around Alfred, here. Okay. Yeah. So... Um, Danny's curious, um, if there's seasonal movement at that joint, then that'll crack the steel surface and allow moisture in. So how are you? The, there, there's such negligible movement. It's not going to open. Okay. It's no, it's not season. The seasonal movement, if anything, what I'm talking about is grain at odd, at right angles to each other. Here I'm showing you with this demo just to show you how it pulls together. I happen to have both pieces moving this way. So it's going to move horizontally, but the dominoes or the splines will keep it in plane on the top so it's nice and flush. It will move in and out, but it's not going to open up the joint. And this is far away from most water in that case. Anyway, you don't really want to get water near it, because that could get in there. I don't, I still don't think it would open up. Once it, you get the finish on there, it's gonna be nicely sealed. So that's how you're protecting, because uh, Mike's asking, by not gluing the seams, how do you keep moisture out of them, so? Yeah, um, if you flooded it with water, you might have a problem, but where this joint is, there's very little water on the countertop. So <laughs> you've gotta do something. With solid wood, you've gotta, get along with it. You've got to find ways to get along with it. So I'm <laughs> going to do everything I can, especially for that undermount sink to seal the end grain. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of things here for you to read. People Great. have been really kind to share their insight. And Yeah. I love the community. I love that you guys are hanging out with me tonight. We, um, we have a good time in the shop and this is a little different project. It's always nice to have that deadline of Christmas where you've got all these projects going. By the way, if you haven't been in on it, we've got, we're in the middle of a jewelry box course right now on Tuesday evenings. And if you're interested in that, 
you still get time before Christmas to knock that out. <laughs> it's only December 1st if you're watching this live. <laughs> so uh, check that out on our website at epicwoodworking.com if you want to join us. We've still got two good sessions to go. And that course involves lamination, curves, a lot of interesting features. Is that it? Um, Probably good. Could we discuss the breadboard idea for a learning curve reason? Maybe another session. Yeah. I don't know if that's something you can address now. Not really. Um, um, I, I need more show and tell for that, but I would definitely like to show that at some point. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That, um, again, is dealing with tenons and long joints where you're tr you've got cross-grain construction. The breadboard end serves a different purpose, trying to keep the table flat, but you have the same issues with uh, not being able to glue up along the joint and allowing for seasonal movement. Okay. Is that the same thing as a butcher block or different? No. No, okay. Different. Okay, so people are curious, they wanna see the um, finished product. Yes. I'm making a video, actually. It's very, it's going to be a truncated video. I'm not talking all through it. I'm going to, uh, I've already made some little clips of um, making the template on the actual, I have a before of the countertop, which you'll be just disgusted. That <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to have an after, assuming everything comes out now. Nice, you've already yeah. built the cabinets, but would you use a template like that to build upper cabinets? Or for a countertop, that's the way you want yeah, to build it. Yeah, but not the upper cabinets. You would do something different to create a template for that. Yeah, it's different. That's a horizontal template. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I had one when I made the initial. Mm -hmm. I just laid that on top of the current because I didn't want to pull it out of there. Yeah. So. Well, thank you again, everybody, for your comments. Tom will definitely read these after. Yeah. Thank you so much insight. once again for hanging out with us mm -hmm. here in the shop. It's made it a really pleasant evening. It's warm in the shop. It's cold and dark outside. But we always have this creative space to share and make some beautiful yeah, things. Thanks for getting into this together. with us. This is a personal project that you're sharing with us. That's yeah, I'll keep you posted. Very kind. All right, everyone. So... Thanks for being with us. We look forward to you seeing you again next time. On behalf of the camera lady and myself, we'll see you next week right back here on Shop Night Live. <laughs> I didn't even yell that, that time. That was good. Come Thanks. In I think I'll mild it down. A little camera activity. Tone it down. All right. Good night, everybody. <laughs> good night, friends. Take care.